Hello everyone, uh, my name is Cornelius Nomechi. I'm a medical doctor from Ghana. I completed my MPA degree at the Harvard TH School of Public Health this past summer. Last year, uh, during my application process, I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Banda Khalifa, who is a friend and a senior colleague. Uh, Dr. Banda's um, knowledge and experience of the graduate application process made it easier to write an outstanding uh, personal statement, also aim for the right test course and finding the right people to write recommendation letters for me. He also gave me a really good insight about the funding landscape available for me for my education. Um, I was able to get admission into most of the top schools that I applied for, including Johns Hopkins, Columbia University, Boston University, and then Harvard University. Yeah, so if you are actually looking to advance your studies and you're looking for a good and friendly coach, I will recommend no other person than Dr. Banda. Hi, my name is Dr. Banda Khalifa. I'm a physician and a current PhD student at the world's number one school of public health, the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I also earned a dual Master of Public Health and Master of Business Administration on a fully funded SOMA Scholar Scholarship here at the Bloomberg School after gaining admission to Harvard, Yale, Columbia, and the rest of the top schools. So, tell a friend to also tell a friend. Come along with me by subscribing to this channel as I share all the techniques and strategies for putting together a strong application package and hear from experiences from some of the most successful international scholars. I will also invite program directors, admission committee members to share insights into what it takes to get into their program. My name is Cornelius Nomechi. I'm a medical doctor from Ghana. I completed my MPA degree at the Harvard TH School of Public Health this past summer. Last year, uh, during my application process, I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Banda Khalifa, who is a friend and a senior colleague. Uh, Dr. Banda's um, knowledge and experience of the graduate application process made it easier to write an outstanding a personal statement, also aim for the right test course and finding the right people to write recommendation letters for me. He also gave me a really good insight about the funding landscape available for me for my education. Um, I was able to get admission into most of the top schools that I applied for, including Johns Hopkins, Columbia University, Boston University, and then Harvard University. Yeah, so if you are actually looking to advance your studies and you're looking for a good and friendly coach, I will recommend no other person than Dr. Banda. Hi, my name is Dr. Banda Khalifa. I'm a physician and a current PhD student at the world's number one school of public health, the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I also earned a dual Master of Public Health and Master of Business Administration on a fully funded SOMA Scholar Scholarship here at the Bloomberg School after gaining admission to Harvard, Yale, Columbia, and the rest of the top schools. So, tell a friend to also tell a friend. Come along with me by subscribing to this channel as I share all the techniques 
and strategies for putting together a strong application package and hear from experiences from some of the most successful international scholars. I will also invite program directors, admission committee members to share insights into what it takes to get into their program. I'm a medical doctor from Ghana. I completed my MPA degree at the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health this past summer. Last year, uh, during my application process, I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Banda Khalifa, who is a friend and a senior colleague. Uh, Dr. Banda's um, knowledge and experience of the graduate application process made it easier to write an outstanding a personal statement also aim for the writer's course and finding the right people to write recommendation letters for me. He also gave me a really good insight about the funding landscape available for me for my education. Um, I was able to get admission into most of the top schools that I applied for, including Johns Hopkins, Columbia University, Boston University, and then Harvard University. Yeah, so if you are actually looking to advance your studies and you're looking for a good and friendly coach, I would recommend no other person than Dr. Banda. Hi, my name is Dr. Banda Khalifa. I'm a physician and a current PhD student at the world's number one school of public health, the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I also earned a dual Master of Public Health a Master of Business Administration on a fully funded SOMA Scholar Scholarship here at the Bloomberg School after gaining admission to Harvard, Yale, Columbia, and the rest of the top schools. So, tell a friend to also tell a friend. Come along with me by subscribing to this channel as I share all the techniques and strategies for putting together a strong application package and hear from experiences from some of the most successful international scholars. I will also invite program directors, admission committee members to share insights into what it takes to get into their program. Welcome, everybody. Um, today we have uh, a very uh, seasoned faculty member to help deliberate on some of the key issues. Um, as usual, uh, this is the Scholars Table. I'm your host, uh, Dr. Banda Khalifa, and I'm excited to take you through this enlightening journey. Um, we are going to explore the intricacies of graduate school application and also delve into the key differences between 
uh, two major doctoral programs, uh, especially in the field of public health. Um, we are exceptionally privileged to have Dr. Anna with us, uh, who is a renowned faculty um, and at the Department of International Health and an assistant scientist here at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, during this session, we'll not only unearth the secrets of crafting a compelling application package, uh, we'll also help explore the nuances between um, a DRPH program and a PhD program, uh, which it will eventually assist you in making the right choice for your career. Um, we'll explore your questions, so keep your questions coming, and we'll offer insights um, into how this will guide you in your academic journey. Um, without uh, much wasting time, let me invite our special guest, um, Dr. Anna, we are live. Uh, good afternoon and nice to have you on this program. Uh, I think you are muted. Classic. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yes, yes. I think we can we can hear you perfectly now. Um, yeah, so uh, it's, it's, I mean, I've been following much of your work. You're doing incredible work, especially... Uh, the multiple initiatives that you're, uh, you are embarking on. Uh, but, I mean, to kick us off with the discussion, could you share a little bit about your own journey in public health and, you know, what led you to this current role? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for having me today and thanks for asking that question. I think we might have lost you. Um, yeah, I think we've lost Dr. Anna. Uh, but uh, yes, yeah, so most of what she's been doing is in the field of international health. Um, uh, she herself has gone through uh, the training, the public health training. Uh, she has a DRPH uh, from Hopkins. Um, so that is mainly where she's working on. Hopefully we'll have her back, uh, soon so we can, uh, continue with the program. Uh, but I mean, for now, this will be an, uh, you know, a very good opportunity for us to interact. If you have any questions, um, please send to your questions and we'll start exploring um you know some of the key issues okay okay so uh dr anna is back again with us <laughs> you would think the internet in baltimore would be better Sorry yeah. About that. <laughs> yeah so i forget uh, your your network dropped um yeah so uh welcome back uh, i think we we uh you were trying to share uh, some of your own journey uh, in a field of public health. Yes. Okay, right. So, um, you know, when I think about my journey, a lot of it for me was um, not really having a clear sense of where I wanted to go, but being mm -hmm. really interested in everything. So my philosophy was really just say yes to as much as possible, um, which kind of led me here. It was a very circuitous route to figure it out. And I always felt you know, like I was the person who was supposed to know, you know, am I going to be the malaria expert? Am I going to be the HIV expert? And that never felt right to me. That was never something I wanted to do. And so I mm -hmm. just kind of said yes until I was able to really figure out um, how to craft my story and my narrative and what I wanted to do. Yeah, I think it's that that story uh, resonates with a lot of people, a lot of graduate students, especially um at the master's level, especially when you're trying to explore your options, uh, your advisors keep asking you, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? And you keep saying, I don't know yet. I don't know yet. So I you don't have to know. <laughs> you know, I think that's the beauty is uh, you don't have to know. And just because your advisors do. Yeah, I, I think today's, today in the, today's network is going to cause some trouble. Uh, I think I'm back with you. Yes, you're back. 
Yeah. Okay. That I, I think that's fair. You don't you don't necessarily have to know exactly what you want to do, you know, specifically. But as you said, uh, knowing that you are you have an interest in public health, uh, you just have to keep saying yes to a lot of things, and then eventually, uh, things work out. Um, so I've I've realized that you're doing a couple of initiatives. Um, uh, what really uh, caught my attention was the Emerging Women Leaders in Global Health Initiative. Um, could you kindly share some light on what exactly is that program and how uh, individuals outside of Hopkins can get involved in that initiative? Yeah, well, first I'll say it's definitely not a Hopkins only initiative. It was entirely mm -hmm. designed to be open. And when we uh, first conceptualized it, it was actually at the start of the pandemic. And for us, it created an opportunity to really reach beyond Hopkins, to think beyond those normal events that we were so often throwing that maybe had you know, 10, 15 attendees that were all Hopkins people, but really to expand and create opportunities for networking. And I saw that there was this need globally for younger women, people who were trainees, people earlier in their careers to network with each other um, and start to explore because so often leadership material is really designed for mid-career women to reach their final leadership mm -hmm. stage. Yeah. And I, I, I really wanted to take a public health perspective, something preventative, right? If we start early, you don't need those interventions down the line. You have people who are thinking from a leadership perspective from the get-go. Great, great, great. So this this particular initiative is not uh, for, you know, anyone in Hopkins. It could be from, you know, wherever you are uh, on the continent, you can get involved in this initiative. Yeah, that's right. We have a, a global online network of over a thousand members who are from all over the world. And in fact, more than half of our membership has no affiliation with Hopkins at all. And it's from outside of the United States. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, um, I have a lot of listeners, but uh, you may be aware most of my followers and listeners are uh, prospective uh, either prospective applicants or currently in graduate school. Uh, so we want to explore a little bit about the graduate school application process and uh, how students can best utilize their time whilst in graduate school. Um, I know you've worked with a couple of students indirectly. Um, in, your, in your own opinion, can you know how do you think candidates uh, can best showcase their potential for success in a doctoral program? Do you mean during the application process? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So to me, I, I think about it the same way that I think about a job application, where you really want to showcase not just what the program can bring to you, but what unique features you bring to the program, right? Mm -hmm. What are the perspectives, the experiences that are different for you? How is your personality going to, uh, you know, capture a, a cohort, you know, and really engage meaningfully with a cohort. And I think so often when I see application materials, it's, you know, I want to come to Hopkins because X, Y, Z reason, the program this, it'll do this in X, Y, Z for me. And these things are all true, you know, but reviewers already know what a school is going to do for you. And we want to know you know, what are you going to do for the, school, for the school, right? How are you going to, how are you going to fit in with a department or, or maybe even change things up? You don't have to fit in, you know, but how can you shake things up as you come? I think that's the kind of thing that's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that is, that is correct. M most, most people I speak to highlight the, the personality uh, aspect mm -hmm. of your application, um, letting your your personality come to life, uh, showing what you're bringing on board, uh, really helps illuminate your path. Um, and I think that is I can just say, like, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people think they have to have some big story, you know, like you have to be, you, you have to have already achieved so much or you have to have come from absolutely nothing. And I don't think that's true. I think to your point, it's about 
personality, mm -hmm. right? And showcasing who you are, showing emotion or empathy or whatever that is, but you don't have to, you know, already be the president of this and that membership, right? It's just about showing who you are. I mean, yeah. real with Okay. Um, yeah, so as, as, uh, yes, she's back. Okay. So, I mean, in summary, you just have to, uh, highlight your personality and uh, showcase what you are bringing on the table and how you apply your own story differs from others. Right. That's right. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, that is the, the individual's own story. Uh, but in, in the area of recommendation letters, um, can you briefly highlight the role of recommendation letters and what qualities are programs looking uh, from the recommendation letters themselves? Yeah, actually, I think recommendation letters for some people are huge. And it's about having someone who can, again, speak to you personally. So not someone who's just recounting what your resume says, but someone who can, you know, share a different aspect. And when I write recommendation letters for people, I always ask, what is something you don't think your CV gets across enough, mm -hmm. right? How can I help highlight something about you, about your experience? And, and in many cases, it's something like cultural competency. Right. And that's the kind of thing that I can reflect on and support a student with in, in discussing that that might not shine through in a CV. So I think that's really where the strategy comes through. Yes. Um, so as as uh, in, in, in summary, your recommendation letter should highlight areas where you've not been able to really talk about uh, either on your CV or your statement of purpose. Uh, it's just an addition to really bring your competencies uh, to to light. Um, so we'll wait for Dr. Anna to be back on. Uh, I, I believe her internet is quite unstable. Um, yeah. So we've we are on with um, we are on with Dr. Anna. Uh, we've spoken about uh, how you can let your uh, application stand out and also uh, delve into the issue of uh, recommendation letters. Uh, so we'll keep our conversation going. Um, so it's, it's at the time of, you know, the admission cycle where decisions have been made uh, people have decided or still deciding on which program to attend. Others uh, are also left uh, devastated because they've received rejections from mm. uh, almost every school. Somebody said uh, he applied to 11 schools. Uh, all of them came back uh, negative. Uh, how, how do you think prospective uh, you know, students can cope with the issue of rejections and how can they improve their future application? That's a great question. Um, and I'm so sorry for the connectivity. I've moved to my phone, so I'm hoping this is better for is, us. Okay. Okay. So, you know, I, I think rejection only makes us stronger and it gets us more perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Because maybe what it means is that the place we were applying to isn't the best fit for us. Right. And, and I think that the first thing you can do is maybe start to, take another look at the schools that are out there because maybe mm -hmm. there's a mentor that's better for you of, you know, some other type of program and students often focus on the big name schools only, but the, like, but why, you know, what's the point of that? There's so mm -hmm. many wonderful programs out there. And, you know, I would also share that from my first job out of my master's program, I was fired after a very short time working there and I saw that as such a major failure. And I think people mm -hmm. see things like rejection as failure, um, but it's not. I look back on that so often and think, thank goodness that happened, you know, because I can really embrace that. And I learned a lot from that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think there was a, a, uh, some time ago I shared my own 
uh, rejection story. Uh, when I was, I think, second year in my master's program, I'd applied to several schools, um, and unfortunately, I didn't get into any. So it was it was really like uh, a difficult time. How did that time. make you feel? Yeah. <laughs> it was a difficult time, but I think it, it also helped me, uh, you know, realize the areas where I needed to to strengthen and and put forward a very strong application the for the following application cycle. So that brief that brief moment in my my in my academic journey was was an eye opener uh to you know to a lot of things and I was grateful that happened. Yeah, and I mean that's what it is. It's an eye opener. It's just a moment to learn something from just like our successes, mm-hmm. right? It's like lessons learned from your successes, from what you see as your failures. And I think there's also something, I'm so glad you said that you shared your story. There's something really beautiful about that because it shows us that we're not alone, that we all have these stories as well and that we can support and learn from each other Mm -hmm. in in that. And I think that's kind of one of the better lessons too, is that, you know, everybody makes mistakes or, or, you know, not every person gets accepted to every program that they apply to and that, you know, then that's absolutely fine and normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So I, I, I want us to, to delve into one critical issue that I think I have not been able to explore yet on this platform. Um, I've, I've had a couple of questions, uh, from people. Some say they've, they applied to a PhD program and instead the program, uh, suggested they can offer them a DRPH program or they should rather uh, consider a DRPH program. Others are also saying they've applied to a PhD and a program is saying uh, they are not fit a good fit for a PhD. They should apply for a DRPH next year. So I, I want us to explore this area a bit further. Um, in, in your practice, what do you think is are the key differences between a doctor of public health and a PhD program, and you know what type of students might be a good fit for um, these two, uh, you know, diverse career paths. Yeah, um, you know, I think so. First of all, I'll say at the end of the day, and in the global scale, right? You, you or others will call me Doctor Anna, and there's no caveat about like what are the letters that create mm-hmm. that doctor. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that that so many people have that concern when they think about DRPH versus PhD, right? Is this going to make me competitive? Um, what does this mean about my career? And the first thing I'll say is, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, get, getting a doctorate will will transform your career. Um, and it it almost at that point, you know, like you don't really have to compare what's going to get you further. It's about what is the better fit for your <laughs> interests. Yeah. And that's why I, I like lead into that is because you really have to think do you want to be a researcher, right? Do you want to specialize in methodologies and like sort of live and breathe research? If the answer is yes, then the PhD is for you. If you're really more interested in like how organizations work, management and leadership, problem solving, but on this sort of, you know, different kind of scale, then a a DRPH could be a really good fit for you because it's not going to focus so much on the methodologies of research, it's going to focus on how do you lead teams, right? How do you understand the questions, the stakeholders, um, you know, and yes, you're going to understand how to interpret data, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's really critical, Um, but you're not going to have to do this data coding, right? (laughs) And you're not going to, right? And then, and for me, that was so critical. I was like, oh, I don't want to do any of that, but I love this sort of like different kind of higher level thinking. Yeah. 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 I think you've 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 uh summed it up perfectly. Um if you want to live and breathe uh research, uh yes. then <laughs> PhD is 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 your route. But if you want a more practically oriented uh you know uh, career path, then a DRPH uh can be a good option. Um uh, but do you think there can be an intersection where, for example, um, a PhD can find themselves uh, back into a lot more practice and uh, DRPH can also find, uh, you know, 
uh, themselves back into a more research oriented field post graduation. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think there's so much flexibility in what we do. And so much of that is saying yes to different things, right? It's about embracing the opportunities that come and that are of interest. You know, I think I'm a DRPH who spends probably more time in research than most. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm straddling it in a different way than a lot of my my colleagues with the same degree. So yeah, there's so much flexibility. It's, you know, it's really more about like what kind of experience I think you want out of a program in the yes, first place. Yes, and I think yes. that's kind of your audience, right? People who are considering these programs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, it's all about the experience. Like, what do you want to learn? What do you want to be able to get out of it? What skills do you want to develop? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fair. Um, so in terms of uh, the application itself for, for prospective, uh, you know, applicants, uh, what should they consider uh, or, you know, what factors should they consider uh, when they are choosing between either a DRPH mm. or a PhD program? I know you've spoken about research and others, but are there other factors for them to consider which one to choose um, to make sure that is a is the right path, is the right career path for them? I mean, let's be honest. One of the biggest things that anyone has to think about with these programs is funding. And the truth is DRPH programs often do not come with full funding, mm -hmm. you know, because it's mostly, I mean, at least at Hopkins, I consider my experience, it's mostly people who are currently working. So they're part-time um, and they might be able to get funding from other resources like their jobs, but very few are offering full funding. And I think, so yes, I mean, for me, the first thing you think about is what do you want to get out of it? And the second thing is, okay, so then what's actually realistic? Because I, you know, I don't believe that most people really benefit from taking out student loans, you know, over and over for all of these degree programs, you know, mm -hmm. for many international students, that's not an option to be able to do that. And so then I think the second component is what are the resources that are going to be given to you that yep. are going to make your life a livable one. And then the third thing I would say is like the people you work with is the most important mm -hmm. thing. Right. And it's not about the project or the topic, what you do on your dissertation. I mean, if you're still doing that in 20 years, I'm going to be surprised, you know, like <laughs> that's not the thing that matters. It's the relationships you're going to build. build. So you want to yeah. find people who are fun and supportive and who will like really be advocates for you in your career. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you've raised some the important important factors for for consideration. So apart from your your own interest in whether you want a research based or a practice based uh, program, uh, you would also want to consider what resources are available. And as you highlighted, um, PhDs most PhD programs often comes with funding as compared to a drph program and also if i think if in terms of the flexibility as you said a drph program will help you you can work whilst in school yeah. so that is another option if you don't want to resign from your current role and you want to continue getting an advanced degree then a drph path it's it's a perfect fit because i don't and that that was a huge consideration for me, actually, was, you know, I spent a long time between my master's and my doctoral program, and I see how PhD students live. And I thought, <laughs> like, no, that is not at that. all for me. Yeah. Like, you know, here I am, I'm like a full grown adult with a salary, you know, like living life, I am not going back to like, you know, PhD student status. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it just didn't make sense in my life. So that mm -hmm. was that other component for me that yeah. was really like, okay, I want to still work and I want to be able to apply what I'm learning to my job mm -hmm. now. And that was really important. Yeah. I think that's, that's um, a, a very important uh, consideration, at least for, for um, the flexibility. I know Hopkins, the DRP program at Hopkins is highly flexible, uh, mm -hmm. but I think other programs might still require you to come on site uh, for a DRPH program. Uh, but the one at Hopkins, I know a couple of people who like are still in their home country and they are enrolled in the DRP. Yeah. So that at least that is a good thing. Um, so in terms of career path, uh, what are the typical career opportunities available for 
uh, graduates of DRPH uh, versus a PhD. Um, I know we talked about how each is flexible, but traditionally, uh, what is the typical career path for someone uh, with a DRPH program uh, versus someone with uh, a PhD program? You know, I think the fun thing is that there's no typical. I look at the people who are a part of my DRPH cohort and they're doing such different things. Mm -hmm. um, you yeah. know, one person was in charge of a major health system. Mm -hmm. um, one person, you know, there were people in high level government positions uh, at the Okay. So, yeah. So I, I think that we've, we've had an enlightening, uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So I would just say there's no typical, uh, and, and that's the fun of it is that you can really apply these skills to almost anything that you're doing in public health. And something I really appreciated was being around people, mm -hmm. not just global health people. Yeah. We yeah. can hear you. Okay, <laughs> sorry. No, that's why I can hear you. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I really appreciated about my program was not just being around global health people, right? Getting to see how other people were planning to apply this to their work, uh, not in academia, not just in global health, but from domestic perspectives in all types of jobs. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great. Um, so. I mean, as you've said, a career path is it's a bit flexible, and these days, even the uh, those being trained to breathe and leave research, uh, leaving the research field after after graduation, so uh, you are allowed to to take whichever path you want to after your program. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but in terms of uh, practical experience, um, what role does that play uh, maybe internships or practical rotations uh, in each of these programs are the DRPH programs structured differently uh, in terms of these uh, factors yeah I mean for the DRPH at least the one at Hopkins there is a practicum component um, and most people do it within their current jobs and then I would also say the dissertation can also be practical in that it can be applied to your workspace, mm -hmm. you know, something that's like new within that space. So in my perspective from the DRPH, you're getting practical, practical, practical every step of the way. Um, yes, rooted in theory, right? Of course, we are we are in an academic setting, um, but you're getting that practicum experience and you're expected to come in with practical experience, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just come straight out of a master's. You really do have to have some working experience yeah. so you could be thinking, how do I apply these skills to the workplace? Okay. Um... I, I think one question that I'm getting from uh, my viewers on YouTube is uh, the area of intensity. Uh, so, mm. uh, and I think that is one of the issues I want to explore. Um, uh, what are the typical demands for, uh, you know, this program, DRPH versus PhD in terms of time commitment? Uh, you know, how intensive the program is uh how do you uh you know what are your insights on that i think it depends on how quickly you want to get it done uh, and again you know my experience is really hopkins oriented but you know we were you're often balancing working and mm -hmm. being a student which I think is true for PhD students as well, right? You are expected to do research assistantships and you know to be, to be working within those projects in addition to this, the classes that you're taking. And with the DRPH though, you have that flexibility to take classes quickly or slowly based on how quickly you wanna get things done, mm -hmm. um, which does mean that the time commitment can be really intense if you're working full time and you know taking a bunch of classes yeah. um you know and then on top of that yes there's still the practicum there's still the dissertation you are still taking exams just like most doctoral students right so it's not um it's not a walk in the park you know you <laughs> you do have to dedicate time to it yeah 
Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, so uh, as you said, each each program is unique, and um, especially with how the DRPH program is structured, uh, it, it's if if you are working full time and also doing a doctoral program, then uh, it's going to feel a bit overwhelming. Um, it's the same with a PhD program; it's also full time, yeah. it's also intensive. Uh, so um, I mean, you have to choose your suffering. Well, you do have to choose your, I love that. You have to choose your suffering. And I think, you know, one of the things I really appreciate about the DRPH program is that because it is people with working experience, right, you're adult learners, Mm -hmm. you can really prioritize what you need to spend your time on. So sometimes, you know, classes and assignments just weren't as important to me as other things. (laughs) And I just felt as long as I could communicate that, right? And clearly, if, if, for example, if I was working with group members, you know, I'm not going to prioritize this right now, you know, then we created an environment where that was okay. You know, no one was really pressuring anybody else. Um, And... And then alternatively, right, when there are those classes that really mattered to me in my career, I would put in more effort. So it's all about what you put into it and Mm -hmm. what you need to get out of it. And honestly, if sometimes you're taking a class that you are just like, oh my gosh, this doesn't (laughs) matter to me, then just do what you need to do, Yes. right, to maintain your sanity. And I think that's true in any higher education program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are some classes that you, you are taking because you just want to make up credit. Uh, yeah. and not because you're really interested in. Um, I think that's that's fairly said. Um, so I, I know we've explored a little bit about, you know, career paths and uh, where you can go and the flexibility involved, but are there specific, I've, I've had issues where people are asking, are there specific industries or sectors that will favor a DRPH graduate or a PhD graduate and vice versa? I don't really think so. I think it's about the experience that you're bringing on top of that. You know, the the doctorate at the end of the day is a set of letters that's coming after your name. Mm-hmm. At the, It's really about the kind of work you want to do and what experience you bring to any role. So I don't think inherently, you know, if you looked at two versions of me, like carbon copy versions, and one had a PhD and one had a DRPH, that at the end, that like a job is gonna look at that and say, oh, I want one version over the other. Absolutely not. I think mm-hmm. it's really, have you gone through doctoral training? Yes. What did you do? What do you, like, what work have you done? What is the focus of that and what do you bring is so much more important than whether it's a PhD or a DRPH. Awesome. Um, uh, we are having a couple of questions, but we'll, we'll start answering the questions. Uh, in a few minutes time, I want us to wrap up our discussion here. Um, so what advice would you give to someone uh, uh, who is unsure whether a career in academia, uh, yeah. that is like a PhD or a career in public health practice or a DRPH is right for them? Um what piece of advice would you give those people? I keep getting a lot of messages on that. Yeah. Um, well, like, let's be clear. You can still be in academia like me with a mm-hmm. DRPH. Yeah. We do, we do exist. Um, in fact, the, my last chair in the Department of International Health was also a DRPH. Mm-hmm. So we do, we exist, <laughs> even if we're in the minority. Um Again, I think it really boils down to like, do you want to live and breathe research? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to have a sort of different skill set coming out? I mean, it's inherently that. It's what are you interested in? Yeah. So, I mean, it comes down to your interest and knowing exactly what you're getting yourself into. Um, I think with that that background knowledge, it will help you make... uh, uh, you know that the informed decision that you you need to make. Um, I would take a couple of questions uh, from uh, LinkedIn. Um, so we have one question from Bello. Bello, say hi, Doctor Anna. Um, can a DRPH candidate move on to lecture in public health, seeing that quite a number of schools post PhD as a requirement for entry? as a lecturer. Oh yeah, you definitely can. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah, yes. I mean, I it's what what PhD is universal, right? It's just the way that people are referring to someone with doctoral training. Mm -hmm. And I think oftentimes we stop ourselves from applying for positions for reasons. Like, I mean, really, I'm, I'm saying that vaguely, like, oh, they want something that I don't have exactly, and then use that as a barrier to not apply. No, all they're saying is doctoral level training. It's not being that specific. And beyond that, what I would say is never stop yourself from applying because what's the worst that can happen, right? Always apply for those positions that are interesting to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, Bello, it's, is is not only PhD, uh, graduates or, uh, who can go into teaching. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, you know, doctoral DRPH uh, faculty here at, at the Bloomberg School. Um, okay. One question from Ernest. Um, Ernest wants to know, is it always the case that once you do a PhD, it's a must to find yourself in academia or there's a possibility to get into the industries if you want? I think that's all about what your... I mean, no, you don't have to be in academia. I know plenty of PhDs who aren't. And in fact, growing up, um, I had two friends, uh, both of whom went and got PhDs in biology. One of them is a professor somewhere, and one of them has been in industry since the very first day that he left his doctoral program. So you can, everything is open. You're not stuck doing research and teaching in an academic institution. Um, there are plenty of opportunities for you. Yeah, and I think like I, I also know quite a few. Uh, I mean, even before they graduated, they had already secured their their jobs in industries. That's right. Um, and you know they didn't want to spend another day in. in, <laughs> <laughs> in and I get that. Thing. I mean, <clears throat> it's a grueling system. Yeah. So you know, if you want out, and it also doesn't mean if you go to industry that you can't come back. Right. That like, just remember your career is a journey. It's not a single mm -hmm. straight line and it never yeah. has to be. So if you want to explore industry and then maybe you hate it, right, there's something else that's out there for you. You don't ever have to be stuck. And I think, you know, we often, um, unity cost, right. Or the sunk cost, you know, oh, now I've gone into, uh, industry and therefore I have to stay there. It's not true at all. You can move and change and transition at any time. Mm -hmm. And all you're doing is bringing with you the skills that you've gained along the yeah. way. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, we, uh, we have one question from Emmanuel. Um, we have one question from Emmanuel um, who wants to know what are the funding options for DRPH, uh, f especially for international students, because, oh, you know, working full time as an international student and, and being in school, uh, even if you put all your compensation together, you, you can't still pay the fees. Um, I know a couple of my mentees who got into DRPH programming. Uh, some other schools got at least got some funding, fifty percent, seventy five percent tuition uh, scholarship. Do you have any idea whether Hopkins gives some, like at least some? Uh, to <laughs> yeah, I mean the Hopkins scholarship for DRPH is really focused from the Bloomberg American Health Initiative, which okay. I think is pretty much automatically taking a lot of international students out of the pool. Out of, yeah, yeah. I mean, and most. DRPH students, at least at Hopkins, cobble together funding from a couple of different sources. So often their workplaces are sponsoring them either fully or partially, um, or you know helping to support travel costs if they're coming to Baltimore for summer institute classes. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, honestly, the landscape isn't great. It really isn't. And so the I think programs are are working and trying to to be better about finding scholarship money. But it's a challenge, and it's a challenge for PhD programs as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, as we said, that is one of the areas you have to consider. And oftentimes, uh, for international students, it all comes down to funding, right? Absolutely. Uh, you want the part that will give you the least resistance or the least stress 
in terms of finding uh, funding opportunities? And maybe um, one suggestion that I can make that I've made to others is if you are, if there's a project you're interested in working on, right, to get experience, you can work with faculty members and they can oftentimes add tuition line items to their budget. Mm -hmm. So you work with them, but they can support your tuition costs. And so that can help if you're already working a full-time job, right? You're getting additional experience with faculty and what they're doing is paying for your tuition. Now, of course, I understand this is work on top of work on top of school, um, but sometimes that can be more available than something like a scholarship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, one of the uh, people I reviewed, uh, his application actually already had funding before he applied. Uh, so in that case, it becomes it becomes easier. But it's, is it is it in terms of getting, I, I know maybe this may be a bit far-fetched, but uh, when your funding is secured, right, before you apply, does it increase your chances of getting admission? I don't think so. Uh-huh. Although I'm not on an admissions committee, so I can't <laughs> I can't tell you for sure, but I actually think it can't. It, uh -huh, um, uh -huh. I don't think it's supposed to influence it. Yes, yeah. yes, I believe so too. Okay. And then uh, maybe we'll take a couple more questions, maybe two yeah, sure. or three questions. Um, yeah, the, the internet is holding on, so I can yeah, do so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We have a question from Vin. Uh, Vin is saying, so are we saying that there is a better lifestyle and relatively lighter workload in DRPH program compared to a PhD? Um, I mean, I feel that way, but that doesn't mean it's true for everyone. You know, mm -hmm. I was in a very privileged position where my work was quite flexible. So I could balance more easily school and work. But that wasn't true for a lot of my colleagues in the program, particularly people who worked in government. So, you know, they couldn't, in, for, for example, in the middle of the day, listen to a lecture. Mm -hmm. You know, it was really they that time was all evenings and weekends. And so it was harder and they went slower um, because it just wasn't feasible for them. So it really depends on your situation. I would say the workload, I'm not going to say it's easier. I'm just going to say it's different. You yeah. know, and so so for me, it's easier because I wasn't trying to learn Stata, you know, so that made it easier <laughs> for me. But if you're a wizard at Stata and that's what you want to do, then maybe a PhD program, you know, is the way for you to go. I think that's all perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you can anyway. tell I'm not a fan of Stata, right? You're like, <laughs> don't don't even put that in front of me. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, so uh that's one question from linkedin uh from ibrahim uh bashir uh ibrahim says uh thank you so much for this initiative and effort to enlighten us uh please for someone who has a career in ngos such as mm -hmm. who unicef or uh usid and other implementing partners which option would be the best for him DRPH or a PhD, uh, all things being equal with this profile. Yeah. I mean, I, so first I would say, I think you could be an excellent candidate for either, right? That kind of experience is really valued in doctoral programs because mm -hmm. you are bringing in a different perspective and context than a lot of other people have. Um, so I could see both programs being really excited to have you. It's about how excited you are to have them. And, uh, you know, I think, again, Banda, this comes down to your interest in what you want to do. Yeah. You know, yeah. so my gut, my gut feeling, right, is, oh, you're working for those organizations. A DRPH could be perfect for yeah. you. Well, sure, it could be. But what if you want to do research, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then it's not, you know, so it could just yeah. be where you want to go with your career. Um, but either one's going to get you ahead. And honestly, that kind of experience is really valuable. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that is that the, the issue of you know, putting your interest in the equation is, is very critical. Um, and I, like most often I feel people uh, know more about PhDs than a DRPH. Yes. So That's they don't know that option of a DRPH exists. So 
uh, that there was one person that I was working with. Um, and, you know, she wasn't very uh, strictly for research, but mm. she just wanted a doctoral program. And when I saw her profile, you know, leading organizations, working with multiple NGOs and the rest, I, I told her to look into a DRPH program because that might fit her profile. Um, she did her own research, came back and said, yeah, this is what I'm looking for. And she applied and she got into like several DRP programs. So I, I, I that is the reason why I think this kind of conversation is great because it also opens up, uh, you know, more options for people who are trying to explore DRPH programs. No, I, I love what you said there, because the truth is that, you know, some of us in global health recognize that in order to do the next step in our career, we need a doctorate, right? I don't think this is required for everyone. Not everybody mm -hmm. wants it. It's not a requirement for everyone's career. But for some people, you recognize, okay, in order for me to do the next thing, I need a doctoral degree. But like your friend, I had no interest ever in doing a PhD. You know, I just knew it wasn't a fit for me. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right. This creates another option for people who are in different spaces in the global health or public health sphere, right? That it just doesn't have to be only one type of program. And then you have to be a, a researcher, that there's this really cool other world out there uh, where you still get that doctoral training. And it's just, it's, you know, it's almost like what you said, it's for people who want a doctoral degree and they don't want a PhD. Yes, 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 exactly. Um, yeah, so we are almost coming close to our conversation. I think it's it's been quite engaging and revealing. Um, our LinkedIn uh, stream just got disconnected. So if you're hearing us, you can join us on YouTube. We're also streaming on YouTube as well. Um, but... Uh, Dr. Anna, your final words for our viewers and how, like, how they can for for the for those interested in uh, joining your initiative that we spoke about. What what is the main, uh, you know, procedure? So let's start there. If you're interested in joining Emerging Women Leaders in Global Health, you can check out the Hopkins Global Health Center website, and we're all over it. So you can join us there and come come find us on Slack. Um, and I'll also post it, Banda, if you don't mind, on your LinkedIn as a mm -hmm, resource sure. for people to come to. Mm -hmm. um, don't do a doctoral program if you don't want to. You know, like really think about whether it's worth the time, energy, effort, money for you, yeah, right? You have yeah. to do a lot of self-reflection in that process. And mm -hmm. I think for me, it took 10 years um, you know, something like that. But before I decided it was right for me, and it was a very specific thing that was right. It was an online part time program where I knew that I could find funding, right? So I needed a, um, a perfect storm. And if you need that, look for that, right? Think really carefully about what that is for you. Um, and then just do some more research about PhDs versus yeah. DRPHs. Mm -hmm. You know, don't think that just because a PhD is the standard and it's what people write on job applications, that it's all that's open to you. Yeah. There is a world of educational programs out there that are available that might be the best fit. So, you know, don't settle for something if it just doesn't seem right to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you've, you've summed everything up. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for uh setting aside some time to, to talk with us um we appreciate it so much and i would i would definitely uh be posting um the emerging leaders uh you know in for women initiative uh on my on my platform so that people can but, and let me be clear men are definitely invited to this too <laughs> it's anyone who is interested in women's leadership including creating supportive and enabling environments we welcome mm -hmm. male allies so you oh, okay. are most welcome <laughs> okay okay understood <laughs> thank you yeah. thank you so much um thank you all for joining us today um i think we would uh have to end our streaming here dr anna uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Hopefully, I'll get to see you one day, pass by the office, and then we can have a uh, informal chat. Uh, so have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you, you too. Bye. 
so yeah, so uh, I mean, today's conversation was mainly uh, about uh, you know trying to uh, explore other options apart from a PhD, right? So if if you want a doctoral program uh, in public health, uh, there are two main options: a DRPH or a Doctor of Public Health, and then uh, a doctor of philosophy which is phd and each of these has their own unique advantages and 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 disadvantages so i'll say strengths and weaknesses so it's it's about it's, it's about the individual uh the onus on you to do your own research look at how these uh, uh programs diverge and how they align with your interest then you can make uh, the best uh, decision. Uh, so I hope this helped you uh, in streamlining your career path. Uh, join us another time uh, and have the best rest of the evening. Bye-bye.